I keep thinking of this Clint Eastwood line. You kill a man, it's you, you kill every opportunity you ever had. I think, I know which movie that's I from. It's a good yeah, one. It's a really good That's line. a really good you line. You kill every opportunity you ever had. Every chance you know? I ever had. You know, and I often think about lives and say what might have happened if that person had lived. Right. Like we think about, I mean, she, yeah, exactly. just a week ago, it was like, God, exactly. he's been dead as long as he's been alive now. He's been dead now as long as he was alive. And you think, that's a funny sand dial to put in front of yourself, you know, to flip that thing over and it's done. Uh, One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You get up in the morning, Belushi, and you say, what am I going to do today? How am I going to spend the day? That's what I do. That's what he does. He is full oh. of creative angst. Yeah. He's the kind of guy, you sit down at a restaurant, he's going to break up matches, he's going to break up toothpicks, chopsticks. He's got a creative energy that, you see, I have the writing. You've got a, you've got a reason to get up in the morning. you got this gig, you know? Yeah, but what about you? You don't have a reason to get up in the morning? Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I, I, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I go, some, well, I'll go to like a record store. You know. to just to check out the sales, no doubt. No, and yeah, no, sure. No. Buy old records. It, buy old it records disturbs him to be idle. Mm, I must does, say, huh? yeah, it does. Yeah. Does it disturb you to be an idol? To be an idol? Yeah. Does it disturb you that so many people know you and yes. grab you and recognize yeah. you? Yeah, you feel like a freak. Yeah, Do you? He has to learn to deal with it. You got to relate to it like you're you're running for Congress. I love it. It's wonderful. No, <laughs> I, 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 I. You really don't like it. Do no, much. I don't like no. it. I don't think anybody who's in that who has that. Well, you have to have the right attitude about it. The name of the record is the best of the Blues Brothers, and the name of the movie is Neighbors, and the name of the men, Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi. It's always fun to have you here. In December 1984, John Belushi gave what would end up being one of his final interviews when he and Dan Aykroyd appeared on the Today Show with Gene Shalit to promote their new film and best of album with their band, The Blues Brothers. The film, Neighbors, promised much but became infamous for reasons beyond its on-screen antics. Initially, the casting of Belushi and Aykroyd, fresh from their success on Saturday Night Live and The Blues Brothers, set high expectations. Their trusty dynamic was flipped at the director's suggestion pushing each actor to explore roles contrary to their comedic personas, with Belushi playing the straight-laced character and Aykroyd the wild and unpredictable rebel. Yet, the creative process was anything but smooth. The set was rife with conflict, particularly between the stars and director John G. Avildsen. And the winner is John G. Avildsen the Rocky. Disagreements over the film's direction led Belushi and Aykroyd to push for Avildsen's ouster, favoring a replacement who could better align with their vision, even suggesting themselves or John Landis for the role. Screenwriter Larry Gelbart's script became a bone of contention as well, undergoing significant revisions at Aykroyd's hand, fueling further discord. Amidst this turmoil, Belushi's battle with drug addiction cast a long shadow over the production. His struggle became intertwined with the film's chaotic creation, with Belushi eventually succumbing to a relapse. Despite these off-screen troubles, Neighbors managed a respectable box office showing, propelled by the star's bankability. Yet, the film's disjointed script and confused tone failed to win over critics or audiences earning a mixed reception at best. Many friends and family would later attribute the production issues with neighbors, as well as the reception of his first dramatic effort, Continental Divide, to John's relapse, as well as what would come next. Becoming weary of his reputation as a player of manic slobs, Belushi broke new ground in his career as the romantic lead in the comedy Continental Divide. The critics praised him for his empathetic portrayal of a very urban newspaper man, in love with the dedicated, wilderness-loving naturalist. The box office response was only lukewarm, though, perhaps because the audience was expecting the old-style Belushi. In a joint interview with Aykroyd last December, Belushi, recalling the shooting of Animal House in Eugene, jokingly offered to leave Oregonians alone. 
Well, it's a beautiful country up there. They got plenty of water, plenty yeah. of trees, and the, the people there should be left alone. You know, to, to live their lives. There will be people who will uh, greatly appreciate that. That's right. <laughs> I'm too. staying away from there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm staying in New York. You're very I'm, fortunate, folks. I died at a very young age here in New York City, so don't worry, I won't come out there. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday today. Happy birthday, today. Happy birthday today. Happy birthday to the Today Show. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. 30 years of beautiful mornings on NBC. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Good evening. For most of his television career, at least, John Belushi careened at a breakneck pace between the irreverent and the outrageous. It was not only his comedy that was unpredictable, there was always a strong sense that the act was a reflection of the man, and the man a bizarre reflection of a generation. Now John Belushi is dead. Not perhaps a superstar of international range, but an especially talented member of an especially talented group that raised television satire to new heights. What they did, those not ready for primetime players, and what John Belushi did with a special zest bordering on vengeance, was to strike a loud and responsive note among millions of sympathetic but infinitely more inhibited viewers. He was 33 when he died this morning. Here's a report from Robin Groth. The Chateau Marmont sits just above Sunset Boulevard in the Hollywood Hills. It is a landmark in this town, a hotel where many actors stay while in Los Angeles and where some live. John Belushi was among the hotel's frequent visitors. He had checked into Bungalow 3 last Sunday, here to begin work on a movie for Paramount. And it was in the bungalow's master bedroom where Belushi was found dead just after noon today. Police say William Wallace, Belushi's physical trainer, came to Bungalow 3 when he couldn't get Belushi on the telephone this morning. Wallace was met by this man, Bruce Beckler, a hotel day security guard. What, what happened is I got called up from the desk to find out what was going on up here at Bungalow 3, and, and I came up, and his friend was already here, and I said, well, we have to do something, and that's when we started the mouth to mouth and all on him. So when we did get to him, I could tell, you know, that he'd been left alone a little bit too long, so he was already dead. He was just such a heavy man, and, and his heart evidently failed on him, is what I think. This woman, identified only as a friend of the actor, was the last person to see Belushi alive. Police took her into custody for questioning. She told police that she woke Belushi around 8 this morning because of his loud snoring. She asked if he were all right. He said he was. Then she got him a glass of water, signed for room service, and around 9, left the bungalow and Belushi's Mercedes. When she returned at 2.30, she was met by police. After being questioned, she was released. But the big question still remains. How did John Belushi die? Yes, uh, it appears that uh, John Belushi may have died uh, by natural cause. We don't know yet. We won't know until the coroner conducts the autopsy. It was early evening before the coroner's office removed Belushi's body from Bungalow 3. An autopsy is scheduled this weekend, and a coroner's report expected early next week. This is Robin Groth for Nightline in Los Angeles. Yeah, baby. John Belushi died March 5, 1982, at 33 years old. Yeah, I've been drinking. After rising to fame as an original cast member of Saturday Night Live from 1975 to 1979, he was in L.A. working on rewriting a screenplay titled Noble Rot, as well as attending meetings for other films, including an adaption of the hit book The Joy of Sex, a comedy in which the studio wanted Belushi to appear in a diaper, much to his dismay. John Belushi's final days were marked by a blend of work, social interactions, and, unfortunately, substance use. Photographer Marcia Resnick captured some of the last images of Belushi six months prior to his passing, offering a poignant glimpse into his final year. These interactions and moments, pieced together, offer a glimpse into the complex tapestry of Belushi's final days, marked by creativity, tumultuous relationships, and a tragic struggle with addiction. During this period, Belushi was also visited by notable figures such as Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. Williams, along with De Niro, was one of the last to see Belushi alive, visiting him at the Chateau Marmont. 
William's visit is particularly noted for happening on the last night of Belushi's life. De Niro, seeking cocaine, called Belushi, and despite Belushi's efforts to ensure privacy for their meeting, ended up interacting with writer Don Novello, discussing a movie project. His evenings were spent with various acquaintances, including Kathy Smith, who was later involved in the criminal investigation surrounding his death. Today, in the case of Catherine Evelyn Smith, lawyers in Los Angeles had asked that the Canadian woman be sent to prison for three years for her role in the death of comedian John Belushi. And that's the sentence the judge handed down. The judge called Smith the source of the poison. It was in March of 1982 that John Belushi's body was found in a hotel on the Sunset Strip. A coroner ruled that he died of acute heroin and cocaine poisoning. Kathy Smith was questioned by Los Angeles police at the time of the death, but was released. Then this article appeared in the 1982 National Enquirer, which uh, quoted Smith as saying that she had administered the lethal drugs that killed Belushi. At the time the article was published, Smith was in Toronto. In Toronto, Smith began a lengthy legal battle against extradition to the United States. But suddenly in January 1985, she gave up the fight. She turned herself into authorities and was returned to Los Angeles. In California, she pleaded no contest to a charge of involuntary manslaughter. Smith admitted she gave Belushi the drugs, but she said she was not morally responsible for his death. Her lawyer spoke about her feelings the about the trial. We could avoid a trial. She has strong feelings about dragging John Belushi's name through the mud, putting his family through that trauma. She had great affection and feelings for John. Uh, Dan, what are your feelings about uh, Kathy? Uh, uh, do you think that that she should be brought back, or what? What are your feelings about? Uh, that? I have no vindictiveness there at all. I, I just, uh, I think she should have been, you know, maybe retained in L.A. But now that she's away in Canada, I mean, there's, I don't think there's any way that that an extradition can go down. And the fact of the matter is that John was, he shouldn't have been hanging out with those people, you know, and. Uh, I don't know that she can be faulted. I really don't know that she can be faulted. Uh, he was definitely the, ha the captain of his own ship, and um, he just was just got in a little too deep. That's what it was, and he was in bad health anyway. He had an uh, enlarged heart, and he was smoking too much, and uh, you know, so this this little kicker she gave him, you know, it just pushed the whole thing over the over the edge. But uh, she was definitely weak people, you know, and uh, some of the other vermin that were, were around were, were terrible. But the fact of the matter is, at the end, John was controlling them all and uh, telling them all what to do, you know, and that's the way he was. He was very powerful. He, he could get you to do anything, and he could do, do anything he wanted against, you know, your will. And he didn't take scolding very well. And uh, it was hard for me to be around him for the, that last little while because uh, he wouldn't listen to me. and. Uh, I couldn't discipline him, and um, I couldn't share in these activities. Uh, I've said in the book that I, you know, had I been with him, I might have, you know, jumped right in alongside it and tried it, you know. But uh, I think what I meant there was just to relieve him of some of the pressure and the stigma, and you know, kind of make people think, well, hell, he wasn't all that bad. I could be just as bad. Well, the fact of the matter is that I really couldn't relate to a lot of that activity, and uh, I don't like people who use cocaine because it makes them psycho and their jaws go crazy and their eyes get, you know, it's just a, a bad, uh, a bad substance generally. And I'll speak out against drug abuse when the U.S. Air Force starts forcing down the smugglers' planes. It's a billion dollar industry. What, what, what can I do other than maybe say to a few kids out there that, you know, it's better to be different and uh, you're more special if you say no when this stuff is offered. Allow me to pause here for a moment with a quick fact. Dan Aykroyd, seen here doing press for the first Ghostbusters film, was extremely close to Belushi, having become like family as they came up in the industry together. What makes this particular interview clip so much more poignant is that, at the time of Belushi's death, Aykroyd had been working on multiple new projects for himself and Belushi to star. He would even use these projects in an attempt to lure Belushi back from California in the days before Belushi's death. One of those projects was none other than Ghostbusters. Aykroyd originally envisioned the film with Belushi in mind for the leading role of Dr. Peter Venkman, aiming to capitalize on Belushi's comedic skill and charisma. The concept drew from Aykroyd's long-held family interest in the paranormal, only in this case, 
envisioning a comedic team battling supernatural forces. However, Belushi's untimely death in 1982 necessitated a rethink of the project. Bill Murray ultimately stepped into the Venkman role, bringing his own distinctive comedic deadpan style. While Murray's portrayal became iconic, Belushi's intended involvement remains an interesting what-if in film history. The Howard Stern Show. It was all supposed to be called Ghostbusters, but we couldn't get the title. Uh, Taft Broadcasting owned it. It was oh. a show with Larry Storch, remember? From oh. Yes, Larry from Storch, F-True, F-True. F-True. Yeah. And, and, and Tennessee uh, and Tuxedo. Forrest, and, yeah, yeah. And Forrest, uh, yeah, <laughs> of course. Right. And Forrest, uh, Forrest <laughs> Tucker, they, they had this show called Ghostbusters, and, um, oh. and I didn't know about it when I wrote it. And but when you wrote it, you wrote it for Belushi. I did. I was, in fact, when John, the, the when the keyboard uh, lit up at the office like like a keno board, uh, uh, t- telling me that you know he was gone. I was writing a line for him. Uh, so so sad. And, yeah. and and you know the the Ghostbusters movie. Of course, you ended up casting Bill Murray in it. Aykroyd had to navigate both the loss of a close friend and the challenge of adapting the project for Murray. Despite this. Ghostbusters emerged as a beloved classic, albeit with the shadow of Belushi's potential contribution forever lingering. But Ghostbusters wasn't the only film Belushi would miss out on. Aykroyd and Belushi were slightly further into the creative process with another project the same year that he passed away. You have another project coming up together? Speaking uh, of right attitude, something about spies? It's, it's written and it's in revision stage right now and we play two uh, guys who work for the Department of Defense and more than that we can't say too much about it but we're looking it? forward. Uh, uh, in concert with Dave Thomas of SCTV. SCTV. Uh, oh, he's funny. That's a funny show. It's a great show. We're happy to have him on our team. Spies Like Us, a 1985 American comedy film directed by John Landis and starring Chevy Chase and Dan Aykroyd, has a notable connection to John Belushi. Initially, Aykroyd developed the screenplay with the intention of starring alongside Belushi. Besides being close friends, the two actors had previously collaborated on Saturday Night Live and multiple films. It was Aykroyd and Belushi's chemistry and comedic timing that had been a driving force behind their success. Spies Like Us was initially envisioned as a vehicle to further showcase their duo. However, John Belushi's tragic death in 1982 prevented this plan from coming to fruition. The role opposite Aykroyd was recast with Chevy Chase taking the part. Despite Belushi's absence, the film went on to become a significant part of the 1980s comedy landscape. Belushi's loss would be realized far sooner than that, however, as Aykroyd would present the award for Best Visual Effects at the 54th Oscars just 24 days after his death. Fulfilling the duo's prior obligation, without his friend and partner at his side, Aykroyd would still pay tribute to Belushi, disobeying a promise made to Oscars producer Howard W. Koch in the process. Have the envelope, please. Thank you. My partner, he would have loved presenting this award with me. He was somewhat of a visual effect himself. And speaking of visual effects, although John Belushi did not directly participate in Ghostbusters, as he passed away two years before its release, his influence on the character of Slimer is a notable aspect of the film's legacy. Dan Aykroyd, creator of Ghostbusters, envisioned Slimer as a kind of tribute to his late friend describing Slimer as the ghost of John Belushi, embodying Belushi's larger-than-life personality and appetites. Though the character's design wasn't meant to physically resemble Belushi, the spirit's gluttonous behavior mirrors Belushi's boisterous and excessive nature. There is no doubt Belushi's spirit and personality traits inspired Slimer's creation. Slimer's mischievous and voracious character reflects the energy and humor that Belushi brought to his performances, making Slimer a lasting homage to the beloved comedian. But as you're writing the script and you're writing John Belushi a line, you get the horrible news that John is gone. Yeah. Which is devastating. Then I had to go and tell Judy. I, I had to get to her before it, it was public. His wife. Yeah, so I ran from our office on 100, uh, 155th Avenue down to her place on Morton Street, and, and then I, I was passing a newsstand, and they, they dropped the truck, the, the bundle the off in there. Belushi dead at 33, so yeah. I just beat her 
I beat it to her place before the headlines, and I, you know, I had to tell her. Was it a shock to you, or was it something that you kind of expected in the sense that John partied hard? I mean, you know, every every guy at Saturday Night Live was probably partying hard at that point, but he was really going hard. I, I, we were afraid that it would happen, and and we were very protective of him. I mean, I flushed a lot of coke down the down the toilet right. in the last, last days, and. Would he get mad at you when you flush? Uh, oh, co- yeah. oh, yeah. He was upset. He was upset. And then uh, he, he went to L.A., and then, you know, business started to close in on him. And I was supposed to fly out there uh, for to meet with him on other things, like, the, the you know, the, the day after he died, I was supposed to leave. But Did you hate his friends? I'm talking about the, these bad influence-type friends. Did you, the did, hangers w- on. Was it, was it impossibly difficult for well, you because you. you loved him so much? Well, you know, for instance, the woman who put the needle in him, Kathy there, uh, sh- she didn't want to kill him any more than I did. She loved him. And I can't bear hate. Uh, you know, I can I can forgive, but I can't forget. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't blame her entirely for it. John was in ill health. He wasn't breathing right anyway. He was drinking a lot, smoking a lot, and and just, that just sort of pissed, you know, pushed pushed him over. But I, I don't have hate for 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 her or anybody. With us now is Daniel Richler, host and co-producer of No Contest, a documentary profile of Kathy Evelyn Smith, produced for City TV's The New Music. Hi, Daniel. Hello. Let me ask you what you expected to find when you were on that plane flying to see Kathy Smith. I didn't have very many sympathetic ideas in my mind about her. I had read all the stories of the debauchery, the drugs, the endless groupy activities that she had. Really, that's the the life she had led ever since the mid-60s. She had bought this glamorous idea about rock stars that the 60s perpetuated, and she never got off the train. So I didn't didn't have any any, uh, cute ideas about her at all. I thought that she was just a damn fool woman who who had lived a a corrupted life and got caught for it. What do you think after you'd met her? Then all the things changed. Everybody I spoke to, Hoyt Axton, Maria McLaughlin here in Canada, her lawyers, even the prosecution, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the district attorney, felt that she was a sympathetic woman with a sense of humor, that she had uh, merely just been a wasted talent, and that somehow down the road she had been led astray. Well, Mary McLaughlin says in the program, as a matter of fact, that, that she could have been a very good backup singer. Oh, that's right. Well, she could have had a, you know, a, a career in, in the music profession. Well, she actually sang with Hoyt Axton and Nicola Larson. Hoyt Axton wrote Joy to the World and The Pusher and a variety of, ironically, anti-drug songs that became anthems of the 60s and 70s. And then it all uh, was thrown away. Well, how, how does it get thrown away? I mean, here's somebody from Burlington, Ontario, trained in computer work. How did, I mean, was there a turning point? Is there one point in her life when she, as you say, got on that train and didn't get off? Well, she had spent most of her life living with or living off rock stars. Uh, Gordon Lightfoot was one. She had a turbulent love affair with him for a number of years. And that possibly was the most respectable of her relationships after that. However, she hung out with the band for far too long, was made pregnant by one of the members. She doesn't really know which. <laughs> uh, after that, there was Hoyt Axton and the Rolling Stones, finally, were the real turning point. Nobody, it seems, has been able to cohabit with the Rolling Stones and come out half alive. Do you see her as much a, a victim as John Belushi, or is that going too far? A number of people say that she was the victim of the terminal lifestyle of John, John Belushi. If you read Bob Woodward's book, yeah. Wired, it's impossible not to see that he was on some kind of suicide mission. Everybody, his manager, Bernie Brillstein, his wife, Dan Aykroyd, John Landis, the director, had all tried to stop him from doing drugs. Stop, stop, put the brakes on. He would not. He'd either punch people in the face or fly off the handle. And she um, was, was therefore a victim of this incredible momentum. In 1984, investigative journalist Bob Woodward was tasked by John's widow to write a book detailing John's life and death. The final product, Wired, The Short Life and Fast Times of John Belushi, was seen a polarizing and dark misrepresentation of the man. Met with harsh criticism, the book was discredited by friends and family involved who felt betrayed by the prize-winning journalist. Critics and readers noted that the book focused heavily on Belushi's drug abuse and the circumstances leading to his death at the expense of exploring the depth of his talent and contributions to comedy and entertainment. The portrayal was seen as one-dimensional and failed to capture the complexity of Belushi's character. Many felt that Woodward's approach was sensationalistic, prioritizing the scandalous aspects of Belushi's life over a balanced or empathetic portrayal. The focus on Belushi's darkest moments led to accusations that the book exploited his legacy rather than honored it. Belushi's family and close friends, including his widow Judith Belushi Pisano and Dan Aykroyd, publicly criticized the book. They disputed its accuracy and condemned it for painting a negative picture of Belushi. Their criticism significantly influenced public perception and the book's reception. 
Some critics argued that Woodward, known for his political reporting, including the Watergate scandal, was an outsider to the entertainment industry and thus lacked the insight and sensitivity required to write about a figure like Belushi. This outsider status, they contended, led to a lack of understanding and nuance in the portrayal of Belushi's life and career. The book raised ethical questions about how Woodward gathered his information, particularly his use of sources close to Belushi, who were still grappling with his death. Some questioned the ethics of publishing certain private details, feeling that the book invaded the privacy of Belushi and those close to him. It has been almost 21 years since Bob Woodward was assigned to the story that would dramatically change his life, change the presidency, and also have a profound influence on American journalism. The Watergate stories he reported with Carl Bernstein for the Washington Post are part of journalism history and American history. Now he and Bernstein have gone on to other pursuits. Woodward is an author of best-selling books about, most notably, John Belushi, the Supreme Court, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He continues as an investigative reporter for the Washington Post, where he is an assistant managing editor, and I'm pleased to have him here to talk about a lot of things. Welcome. Thank you. Pleasure to have you here. The, the, there's always uh, an effort to keep it from coming out, and my latest book, Wired, about drugs in Hollywood and uh, really a billion-dollar industry, uh, the same squawking and the same, you know, either we already know about this, why do we have to know, or isn't, uh, why are you naming names, why is, is this so specific? And, and is it true that once people do talk to you, they don't eventually usually like what you print? And uh, because uh, the, the wife of John Belushi in your book, let's just have a quick look at it again, yes. um, actually says she doesn't even recognize her own husband from the book and she feels you've betrayed her. Well, she says that and then she speaks out of the other side of her mouth and said uh, it turns out to have been worth it and she would even do it again because maybe some people will have learned the lesson. Well, Woodward, it's fascinating business you're in, absolutely fascinating. I hope I never become one of your victims. Harold, did you actually know John Belushi? Oh, quite well, yeah. We worked together on stage for oh, a year in Chicago in early 70s and then for a year here in New York at the National Lampoon, yeah. Of course, this book is coming out wired by Bob Woodward, who did All the President's Men, co-authored that with uh, Carl Bernstein. Were you interviewed by Bob Woodward? Yeah, spent some time with Bob. Have you read the book or the no, excerpt? No, I'm hearing terrible things. People that really knew John the best and loved him the most are, are, probably won't be pleased by this book. And so you don't have any idea whether your input is, is reflected in the book, is that? Well, uh, there's so many sensational aspects to John's life. Uh, I really felt when I talked to Bob Woodward that those things did not need more comment. Uh, so uh, we had a pretty clear understanding that uh, the purpose of our talk was to discuss the, John's early years at the Second City and uh, what he was like then, which is really, and at the National Lampoon, which is when I knew him best. And uh, enough people will uh, talk about the sensational side, I think. Dan, I, I want to ask you, um, this book, Wired, Bob Woodward, did he talk to you ever before he wrote that book? He, he spoke with me about an hour and a half. and. Uh, you know, there's things in there that I don't remember saying to him that, uh, and uh, first of all, the book, I've skimmed through excerpts of it. It's, it's really pulpy and trashy. It's not well written at all. And Bob Woodward, he was a man with a very respectable career. Uh, all the president's men, the brethren, and uh, his, his research and newspaper work. And then all of a sudden, he does a book called The Short Life and Fast Time to John Belushi. What a kind of a cheap you know, he's, he's just stepping down into that seedy world, and I think he's really avoided many issues in the in the book. He certainly has avoided uh, the issue of of what a fun bag John was, what a great guy he was, what a warm, humorous, really you know, concerned and bright, educated, well-read individual this guy was. I mean, if he, how did he get to be success so successful? He was smart, you know. It wasn't just you know he wasn't just given this. Uh, this break and uh, you know he had to work for what he what he had and, and uh, Woodward completely skirts that and it's a depressing sordid tragic book he jumps around the issue of the the police probe and uh, the fact that some of the people that were purveying drugs to John were friends of police force members in Los Angeles and uh, this is something that he wimped out on and I have heard that he really didn't write most of the book that it was John Anderson 
the, uh, his researcher who, who put down most of the material on paper. And uh, for my part, I just think it's very depressing summer reading, you know. On the flip side, Bob Woodward has defended his work on several grounds over the years. Addressing the criticism it has faced, and highlighting in-depth and factual interviews he conducted while doing his research. But who better to hear it from than the man himself? Why did you write about Belushi, and what can you tell us about him? Yeah, the, uh, I was at the, uh, in the office of the Post, and his widow, after he died uh, in 1982, wanted to come see me. She was from Wheaton, Illinois, where I was from and where Belushi was from. I'd never met Belushi, never met her. And she said, I want you to investigate the death of my husband. And I said, OK, I'll do it hmm. if you give me and help me talk to everyone, all the actors, Jack Nicholson, the directors, and so forth. And she did, and all the records. And um, I found out that uh, they were all drug enablers. They made it possible. And I put that in the book because it was right out of their own mouths. And they did not like it. And they, uh, and uh, I understand why they didn't like it. But again, uh, they failed. John Belushi, they'd give him, he's on the move, a movie. And they, the studio would give him $2,500 in cash per diem. Now, why does an actor, you know, their credit cards, there's things to buy drugs. They knew it was for drugs. And uh, he was great under drugs. But um, I learned personally a very good lesson that when you have somebody you know who's going off the edge, you can't kind of say, well, not my responsibility. It is your responsibility. And that you have to uh, help people. And I think uh, in this case, they did not. I remember going to a college audience once and somebody some, asked, your, why did you write about Belushi? And I gave my answer and he said, well, I know why you wrote about Belushi. And I said, why? And he said, because he's just like Richard Nixon. And I said, why? And he said, good answer. He, he said, because it's about the failure of success. Nixon was at the top, and he crashed. Belushi was at the top, and he crashed. He converted success into failure. Of course, there was also his comments at the 1989 Cannes Film Festival, where he was promoting more than just his book. The character and power of uh, Belushi, I was a real fan. I, th I thought he was truly the great American comedian, or certainly the great uh, comedian of the 70s, and uh, I couldn't stay away. In 1989, Woodward's book was turned into a feature-length film. That, however, is a story for another time. Until then, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future installments, slap a like on it, and maybe send it off with a share to a like-minded friend. What do you think about John Belushi? Have you ever read the book Wired? We want to know in the comments below. Until next time, this is Editor Zach with another EZ Review. John, there's a light within you. I want you to burn it out. Burn it out! Cut the demons loose, John. Let them loose. Oof. Make them laugh. Make them laugh till it hurts. The new Spencer Tracy. I'm a soul man. 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 Totally wild. Yo, what I got. <laughs> oh, hey, Danny. Oh, I'm feeding him speed now. He's every day. I'm so hot. Who's the soul?
perfect world, isn't it? <laughs> you want you to die. I'm gonna be all right. Grab a rope and I'll pull you in. Give your hope. There's my bad boy. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the last time I have you exactly where I want you. If you can't police the guy 24 hours a day, every day of his life. How do you think he died? You couldn't even wait until my body was cold, could you? No! He lived as if the party would never end. No! Wired. For John Belushi, every night was Saturday night. Ah!